In the name of God, who forgives, heals, and reconciles us. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> When I was a student at Immaculata High School, which was many years ago, <laughs> every Ash Wednesday, the favorite question asked by us girls was, what are you going to give up for Lent? Well, given we were teenagers, you can kind of guess some of the answers. Sweets, <laughs> watching soap operas, boys, breaking my parents' curfew, etc. And without fail, the dutiful nuns who were our teachers corrected us. They would remind us that Lent is not a time to give up something, especially the trivial things, but a time to take on something. Something that would be difficult for us, challenge us, and make us better Christians, citizens, and adults who would make a positive impact on the world. And they would also remind us very strongly that we are mortals and our lives on this earth are short. The older I get, the more I focus on the two primary reasons Ash Wednesday exists in the Christian church. From the days of the early church up until our present time, Ash Wednesday is a solemn day. It is a day to remember our mortality. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And it also is to spend the next 40 days reconciling, reconciling ourselves to God. As Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The bottom line, Ash Wednesday is about death and reconciliation. These two things are not trivial at all. They take a lot of hard soul work where we must dig deep and engage in honest, sometimes painful self-examination. And righteousness, the righteousness Paul talks about is this, that we cannot really be reconciled to God if we are not reconciled with our neighbor. Paul echoes this theme we find in the scriptures, the spiritual truth that God reconciled himself to all things through Jesus, and this is the really important part, and by restoring our right relationship with God, Jesus also opens the door for us to live in right relationships with, e with each other, creation, and ourselves. It's really important. Jesus also opens the door for us to live in right relationships with each other, creation, and ourselves. And note, while Jesus opens the door, <laughs> it is up to us to choose to walk through it. God does not force us to live in right relationships with each other. So I looked up in the dictionary just to refresh myself. What does the word reconcile really mean? in terms of definition. And it means two people or groups become friendly again after an argument or disagreement. Reconciliation means two people or groups become friendly again after an argument or disagreement. Well, I can't imagine how this works on a global scale or even in situations that may not directly impact my life. How can the Ukrainians ever reconcile with the Russians, given the violence, destruction, genocide, and so much death Russia has unjustly inflicted upon them? 
How can the parent of a child killed in a mass shooting ever reconcile with the murderer and with the impotent, indifferent lawmakers who do nothing to prevent such tragedies? How can younger generations ever reconcile with older generations who have denied climate change and continue to destroy our fragile planet, making it more uninhabitable for them to live on? When I started pondering these questions, I felt a bit overwhelmed with a feeling of helplessness and hopelessness. The best I can do, the best any of us can do, is focus on our own lives and examine the quality and health of the relationships we have in the here and now. And this, my friends, is the first step in reconciling with God. And time is of the essence. Life is short. If we leave this deep soul work of reconciliation until tomorrow or next week or next year, the door may close and we are left maybe with guilt, sadness, and regrets. I know this from my priestly experience. Often when I am ministering to someone who is dying, the estrangement from another person is intertwined with a feeling of estrangement from God. And the same can be said of the family members or friends who are left behind. If there has been hostility, which has resulted in estrangement with the deceased loved one, there can be, and often is, a lingering painful feeling that one has failed in his or her faith, that he or she has been a bad person who will face some kind of judgment or reckoning by God because of the unresolved dynamics or issues that they have with a relationship with another. One of the most poignant situations which exemplifies this connection of being unreconciled with others and thus feeling unreconciled to God was when I served as a chaplain in a nursing home. One of the residents was an older woman who was being kept alive by machines and a feeding tube after suffering a massive stroke. There was no hope of recovery for her. She was unresponsive, totally immobile, and in a persistent vegetative state. She had been a resident in the nursing home for five years, being kept alive in that state. While encouraged by doctors to take her off life support, her husband, a retired admiral in the Navy, refused to do so. I visited at least twice a week with the Admiral and his wife. In the five years since her stroke, he had transformed her private room into a beautiful space. There were fresh flowers everywhere, family pictures everywhere, some furniture from their home, and always in the background, a soft classical music that he had playing on a boombox. As I got to know him, he eventually opened up and shared with me his story. He suffered from great guilt about how he had conducted himself during their 40-year marriage. He was a drinker. He was violent to her at times. He cheated on her. He neglected her and their children, being a workaholic in the military. And it was only after she had the stroke that he realized the years he wasted and how badly he had treated her. And now he was trying desperately to make it up to her 
by being with her every day at the nursing home, bringing her gorgeous flowers, talking gently to her about maybe the few good times they had, and playing her favorite classical music. But it was too late. The door Jesus opened for him to be in right relationship with her, his wife, had closed. And now facing death, hers and his own, were very frightening to him. He could not envision God forgiving him, loving him, or ever reconciling him to her, even in eternity. Today, this Ash Wednesday, let us ask ourselves, who in our life do we need to reconcile with? What issues are we failing to address in our relationships? What conversations are we neglecting to have? What painful aspects of ourselves are we pushing to the side and not examining or owning up to? And with these questions, let us remember that life is short. We don't have all the time in the world to walk through the door Jesus has opened for us to live in right relationship with others. And so let us have the courage on this Ash Wednesday to take this first step to reconcile. For it is a step essential on our Lenten journey to continue to reconcile to God. We cannot have full reconciliation with God if we are not reconciled to each other. As the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, without reconciliation, there is no peace. Without reconciliation, there is no peace. And he is, God rest his soul, he was the Archbishop um, of South Africa. And we know he was there during the time of apartheid. And he knows something about what recon reconciliation meant. Without reconciliation, there is no peace. It is my prayer for each of us that we have peace. That we have peace. The peace of God that passes our understanding. But the peace of God, which is the life that really is life.